My name is Anne Kinseth and I'm the Director of Education here at the Meadows Museum. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for our Learning at Lunch program. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker today, my colleague, Shelley DeMaria. She's the Curatorial Assistant at the Meadows Museum, which is a position she's held since 2011. She holds Bachelor of Arts degrees in both art history and Spanish from SMU, as well as a, master's, a Master of Arts in Art History from Hunter College in New York. And during her time with us at the Meadows, uh, she has curated several exhibitions, including Dali, Poetics of the Small, 1929 to 1936, Salvador Dali, an early surrealist masterpiece, and Human Nature, The Ridiculous and Sublime, recent works by John Alexander. So please join me in welcoming Shelley De Maria. Thank you, Anne, um, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I wanted to thank Anne for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, I've spent a lot of time um, working on Dali um, during my time here at the Meadows, and it's been a couple of years since I've really um, been delved into it. So um, I realized as I was kind of preparing for today that I have lots that lots to say, lots to talk about. So I'm going to do my best to um, be concise and keep us in our lunchtime hour. Um, but I wanted to, um, let's see if I can advance my screen. There we go. Um, I wanted to talk about three works by Dali um, in our collection today, um, which span um, the various uh, media that he worked in. So painting, sculpture, and prints. Um, as some of you may be familiar with our collection, um, the painting that I'm showing here in the middle of the screen um, is the, the single painting by Dali that we have in our collection. Um, and the sculpture as well is the single example of a sculpture by Dali that we have in our collection. And then I've selected um, the Prince series Aliyah from 1968 as an example of Dali's um, print work to talk about today. We do have um, various prints by Dali in our collection, all from uh, the 60s, early 70s. Um, but I've selected these to talk about because these three works are all fairly recent acquisitions into our collection. Um, the painting um, was acquired uh, at the very end of 2014. I believe we announced it in 2016. And the print series and the sculpture um, have been acquired since then. Um, and I think just through these three examples, um, I think it's really possible to get a sense of kind of the varied mode of productions uh, that Dolly worked in throughout his career. Um, so I think by just looking at these three works, we'll get a good sense of uh, what Dolly was doing. So we'll start with the fish man, um, which is um, the earliest work by Dolly in our collection. And it was painted in 1930 uh, at the beginning of Dolly's association with the surrealist group. He joined the group officially in 1929. So just one year after he joined with the surrealists, um, he painted the fish man. Um, and because this painting belongs to Dolly's uh, early sur surrealist career, I think it's a great example for us to use um, to be able to see um, some of his earliest uses and development of certain iconographical motifs that he then used repeatedly throughout primarily the 1930s, but later as well in his career. And so um, in terms of, of the Fishman, what are those motifs that I'm referencing? Um, it's the desolate landscape. It's a solitary figure within that desolate landscape. Um, there's an abundance of cypress trees in his paintings at this time. Um, harsh uh, shadows and sometimes mysterious shadows and paintings that come in from the outside edge that don't correlate to any object um, within our frame of view. Um, the woman's red shoe, uh, which you see here at the upper left corner and um, the clock. Um, and so I wanted to discuss just a couple of these um, objects in regards to how they appear in the fish man. Um, as we kind of unravel a little bit of, of this composition and the subject matter that uh, he's depicting here. 
Um, so the clock um, that we see here at the center of the figure's head, this actually may be, um, we haven't fully confirmed this, but we think it's possible that the instance of this clock in the fish man may be um, the earliest use of a clock within Dolly's work. Of course, we're all familiar with um, the melted clocks from the persistence of memory that appeared um, really just one year later in 1931 when he painted this work. Um, and um, we'll see the clock in other paintings as well. And you'll see in the 1930s into 1931 um, that you go from this very um, solid round form of the clock and it start, starts to slowly distort until what we see um, in the persistence of memory. Um, and if you notice, um, I'm showing a detail here on the right. Um, so the figure's head is formed with the clock as well as several fish forms that kind of take shape around the clock to form this profile. Um, presumably these fish forms then account for uh, the title of the painting, the fish man. Um, and you see they're kind of these elongated fish forms, very simplified. Um, the, the back kind of fin of the fish forms the figures, what would probably be his hair, the, the back of his head. Uh, and I think what's interesting um, to note as I delved into researching this painting a couple of years ago is that this wasn't actually the first time that Dolly used the form of a fish to form a figure's head. So there's this other painting from the previous year, from 1929. This is the portrait of Paul Eluard. Um, and you can see, um, I, I pulled out the, a detail of the spot that I'm um, referencing in the painting, this detail here on the right, um, in this kind of shape that protrudes out of the torso of Paul Eluard. Um, it's, it's a figure's head, so it's a figure in profile, much like the fish man, and, it's, and the, the profile is facing downward, so the figure is looking down towards the ground. Um, you have the nose that protrudes downwards, and then the back of the figure's head is red. And that is actually a fish. If you look closely on the left edge, what would be the, the top of the figure's head, you can see um, the fish's mouth and it's opened, um, and there's these glaring teeth. Um, so this is just another instance, um, certainly not in the same form as the fish forms from the from the fish man from our painting. Um, but I thought it was interesting to kind of find this previous example where Dali has fused um, a fish into a figure's head. And then this, I'm sorry, this is a poor reproduction, but this is a drawing that um, that kind of mirrors what he was doing in the fish man. Um, and this was a drawing from 1932 that he did. So you can see that he still kind of plays with this, this um, this combination of a figure's head with um, comprised out of fish. So you see the central figure who's uh, looking to the left, we see him in profile and it almost looks as if like these flames are coming out of his head and those are all these little um, very simplified fish forms that are forming essentially the figure's hair. Um, before I talk about the next uh, symbol in the painting, um, I wanted to note that um, when we talk about uh, Dali's work, especially his work at this early time, um, it's important to note his personal biography, which really um, formed a lot of his subject matter or, or informed his subject matter, especially in the early 1930s. So um, in 1929, Dali met Gala, um, and this is a, a photo of the two of them, probably in 1929 when they um, first met and fell in love. And Gala would become Dali's, um, his muse, his manager, um, his wife. They married in 1934, I believe. Um, and so I'm, show, I'm showing here um, on, the, on the right, it's a detail from the fish man. And again, I'm sorry, it doesn't translate very well. Um, blown up on the computer screen, but this is the basically Dali's signature on the fish man and it's an inscription to Gala. It says Por la Olivet and then Salvador Dali 1930. So Por la Olivet translates to for little olive and that was um, essentially a nickname that Dali used to refer to Gala and supposedly 
it was in reference to, I think the quote is the oval of her face and the color of her skin, meaning they were all of like. Um, and so he dedicated this painting to Gala at the beginning um, of his surrealist career. And it, and it shows um, the beginning and, the, and then eventually the growing influence that she uh, would have over his work. Um, and I mentioned this because I believe that her influence um, and her presence in the painting extends beyond just that inscription. Um, I, through my research, I've kind of posed the suggestion that um, this red uh, woman's shoe that we see at the upper uh, left corner of the painting may be a reference um, of some sort to Gala as well. Um, so, and you'll see, and I pulled out um, a couple details here on the right. So there's that red shoe at the upper left corner, and then the shoe form is repeated again in the figure's chest. So it's almost as if it's protruding from underneath the figure's skin um, at the place located essentially where his heart would be. Um, and I relate this to Gala for several reasons. Um, like the clock, this uh, symbol of the shoe first began appearing at this time. Again, this may be, this painting may be the first instance of the red shoe showing up in one of Dali's compositions, but it certainly was then a, a symbol that he used often in the early 1930s. And it relates to, um, a sculpture or a, what he called a surrealist object that he made um, the following year in 1931. And this is a recreation here that I'm showing that's in the Art Institute of Chicago's collection. Um, so Dolly began, make, began making surrealist objects in 1931. And this, this one with the shoe was one, the first such object that he made. Um, and it's thought that in the original version of this object, the shoe that he used was in fact Gala's. Um, and so in that sense, we kind of start to get the sense that this, this relates back to Gala and the importance of the, the red specifically um, in the painting. And so I've tried to kind of pull these elements together and and come up with different interpretations of what might be happening um, in this painting. And, and I'll just offer one that um, I've kind of landed on, which is that I think Dali is um, kind of memorializing in a sense, this, the start of his relationship with Gala and recognizing um, you know, what a force she already is in his life at that time. Um, and so I see it, there's different interpretations in terms of this, this figure, is this figure male, is this female figure, is this a female figure? Um, it's certainly uh, an androgynous figure and I think probably purposely so. Um, but I read this as a bit of kind of the, the melding of Dali and Gala into one. Um, and I think that, that plays into the signature of how he, um, inscribes it to her using this nickname um, that references her in later works he'll he'll start to sign his paintings Gala Salvador Dali as if they're one person and so I see this figure almost representing that transition of of recognizing the the combination of his figure with hers and that's I see um, takes shape through um, Principally through the through through the shoe, which we uh, see as representing Gala, and then the shoe placed at the figure's heart. I think that that is kind of a poignant way for him to um, to combine their two figures into one. Um, and one more thing I wanted to note about this painting before we move on to the next um, work by Dolly in our collection is that. The Fishman was included in the first exhibition of surrealist art in the US and that exhibition was called Newer Superrealism and it was held at the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art um, at the end of uh, 1931 from November 15th to December 7th of 1931. And this was an exhibition that essentially this was the first time that the surrealists were presented as a 
as a group, as a movement, certainly works by the Surrealists have been shown in the US prior to this date, um, but this was really the first exhibition that um, kind of culled their work into a cohesive movement. Um, the exhibition included 49 words total by eight different artists, and Dali was represented with uh, 10 works, eight paintings and two drawings. And so I just wanted to show, um, these are the eight paintings that were in the show by Dali. And you'll see the fisherman at the top center. The Persistence of Memory was in that show. Um, and these paintings are all from, they're all from 1931, except for the fisherman, which is from 1930. And um, I think it's just, I. I like to show them all together because I think it, it helps to show how the fishman falls into what Dali was doing at the beginning of the 1930s. Um, all, all but two of these paintings were comparable in size and that is that they were very small in size. Um, what I didn't note at the beginning of my talk is that our painting and the fishman is 10 and a half by seven and a half inches. So it's a very small painting, um, which is, a, uh, I think just slightly smaller than um, the size of the persistence of memory. So most of these paintings, except for I believe it's the the two on the bottom that flank the persistence of memory, those I think were larger, but the rest were very small in scale. And he's using here um, a very similar palette throughout the composition of uh, many of them are similar in terms of, you know, these desolate landscapes, these figures that, um, are on their own. Several of them are kind of hiding their faces, um, some mysterious shadows that appear. Um, so I just, I like to show these all together to, sh to show how the fisherman fits into um, this time of Dali's career. And I think with that in the, for the sake of time, um, I will move on to the next work, which is our sculpture by Dali titled Venus de Milo with Drawers. And um, the example of the sculpture that we have at the Meadows Museum uh, is a later work, it was cast in 1971, but the Venus de Milo with Drawers was uh, an object that Dali first conceived um, in 1936. So still very much uh, within his surrealist period. Um, and so this is another object that falls within the category of a surrealist object. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, with the, the object of the, with the red shoe uh, that Dali first did in 1931. This was another object that he created um, to be kind of understood in that vein. So Dali took inspiration from the second century BC marble, uh, the Venus de Milo that's housed at the Musée de Louvre in Paris. And I, I'm showing that on the left here. Um, and so he looked to that and decided that he wanted to create his own surrealist version of it. Um, so in 1936, he modified this uh, original Greek form and uh, he added six removable drawers to the figure's body, which you see, um, which you see here in the, the two images on the right, one in the forehead, two at the breast, the abdomen, and then the figure's proper left knee. Um, and each drawer, which was functioning, it, it was fully removable, um, included a metal pole with a mink pom-pom, which we see in the center. Um, and so the center image is that original plaster reproduction that Dali produced in 1936. It now belongs um, to the Art Institute of Chicago's collection. And it's funny, uh, the, apparently it was the British surrealist um, Conroy Maddox who suggested that that this form was the result of a linguistic confusion um, in which Dali interpreted the English phrase, a chest of drawers in a very literal, perhaps the most literal, literal sense um, to form this figure that is a chest, has a chest of drawers. Um, so as I said, the initial object, which we see here in the center um, and then the, the meadows version is the, the image on the right but the initial object was formed in plaster. Um, it was approximately 38 inches high, which was about half the size of the original uh, marble Venus on the left. 
And it remained largely unknown, this plaster reproduction that he created in 1936 remained largely unknown until uh, the 1960s. Um, at that time, it was acquired by a Paris art dealer um, who, uh, with Dali's permission, cast an edition of six bronzes and four artist proofs uh, in 1964. Those uh, bronzes were then painted white to mimic, I suppose, both the plaster uh, as well as the original Greek, uh, Greek marble. And what happened after that, after these six bronzes were cast in 1964, is that then over the next 25 years, essentially until his death, uh, Dali continued to recreate this version of the Venus de Milo with drawers. And so that is where um, the Meadows' copy comes from. It comes from a small edition, um, a small edition of 150 um, that was cast in 1971. Um, there, were set, there were various editions um, that were cast. I mean, some were editions of, I think, 500, maybe even 1,000. Um, so the edition that we have here um, at the Meadows is great because of these, of these editions that came later, it is most true in form to what Dali's original plaster looked like. Several of the other editions had different patinas and uh, were, so they were different colors. Um, so ours is, it's white, which mimics the original. Of course, it lacks the mink um, pompons, but it has the, the six functioning drawers. The drawers in our sculpture all um, are fully removable. Um, and it's like many of these later editions, it was smaller, it was even smaller in size. So it's 15 inches high um, as opposed to Dolly's original plaster, which was 38 inches high. Um, so it's a smaller version, um, but you can see how it, how it compares to Dolly's original vision. And then I thought it was just fun to see that um, as we looked at in the Fishman and in the paintings of that time, um, Dali was often um, repeating forms that he created in several works. So here you see the form of a, of a female figure um, with the torso of drawers and how, how Dali would utilize that um, in different media um, and in different, different modes. Um, at the time. And the final work um, is the print series Aliyah from 1968. And Dali uh, created a lot of prints um, in the 60s. A lot of them were for commissions. Um, they were illustrations for books or um, different stories. This uh, Aliyah was likewise a commission that he received from Samuel Shore of Shorewood Publishers in New York. And he was commissioned to create a series of uh, 25 images that were being made to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel. And so to complete this commission, Dali's part was essentially, he made 25 mixed media paintings. So he made paintings in gouache, watercolor, and India ink on paper. And then those 25 paintings were then reproduced as lithographs. Um, it was an addition of 250. So 250 sets of these 25 images. Um, the title page, which we're looking at here, uh, features a man who looks upward um, and he's wrapped in the flag of the state of Israel. And then the following 24 images, and I have just uh, a selection of them that I'm showing here. The following 24 images then took inspiration from um, both the Hebrew Bible as well as contemporary history um, to address just a variety of subject matter related to Jewish history. And uh, essentially the images uh, begin um, with the exile of Jewish people to Babylonia in the fifth century BCE, and then traces this history. So traces um, the Jewish resettlement of the Holy Land and the Holocaust. Um, and the 1948 Israeli Declaration of Independence is depicted, um, as well as the ensuing Arab-Israeli War of 1948 to 49. 
He also, as you can see in some of these images, um, incorporated references to Jewish symbols and culture, um, the Star of David, uh, the Torah, uh, the menorah is here. Um, so it was a, a mix of images and it's thought that uh, although it's not known who exactly Dali might have consulted with, it's definitely thought that he probably had input and consultation from, um, from someone who kind of helped guide him in terms of uh, the subject matter that was included in these images. Um, and I think just from the selection that's that I'm showing here, you can get a sense of, um, you know, how in this medium and in these lithographs, um, his style comes ac across quite differently. Um, there were some prints, um, I think, let's see, of the ones that we're showing, um, Probably the print in the lower left corner is a good example of of how he used he kind of repeating motifs throughout his prints. So we have um, also in our collection um, Dali's uh, print series um, of Faust and Dali's print series um, titled Poems of, of Mao Zedong, both uh, at the end, both published uh, at the end of the 60s. And, and those prints kind of show similar figures and a landscape with these receding diagonals. So I think it's interesting to know that, you know, this was a very specific commission that he was fulfilling, but he resorted to um, certain compositions and certain elements that he would insert into these works that were very much in the vein of what he was producing elsewhere as well. Um, I think given the time, I will stop there and I will stop my uh, screen share um, and open it up to questions, comments, um, conversation. I know that was uh, a whole lot of information um, condensed into a very short amount of time. But like I said, I, I have so much I could say about these. So I'm curious to kind of know what um, everyone's interested in. Um, so we'll go from there. Well, Shelley, thank you so much for a really wonderful overview of the Meadows Museum's holdings of Dali. We already have questions in the chat box. So um, the first question uh, is in reference to the fish man. And I don't know if, if there's anything to this, but Maria is curious if there's any significance or symbolism of that long wall that we see. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm not in, in the work and the research that I did into Dali's uh, early paintings of this period. I didn't find anything specific that would indicate if there's a specific meaning behind that wall. Um, but it is it is uh, an element that kind of appears in more than just our work. Um, I think I think it may it may in part be um, kind of a compositional element that um, kind of it created a, a nice diagonal. Um, some kind of element to break up these desolate landscapes. Um, but of course, then, you know, there's a bit of a crack in the wall and the bricks in ours, which I'm sure quite possibly had some sort of meaning, whether, whether it was specific or it was kind of left for it to be a meaning that we all interpret um, ourselves. I don't know. Um, I think the wall also gives, um, gives a chance um you see and um, let's see i should just go back and share my screen and see if i can um get that image back up here um bear with me while i go let's see well okay hold on So you see kind of halfway back on that wall, there's a, like what looks like a pebble um, that's placed on the wall. And then you see the shadow that protrudes over the wall. I think maybe the wall um, just gave another excuse for him to be able to play with shadows. Um, shadows are definitely um, 
kind of a main character within these works. So um, I read it that way. I know actually, as I'm pulling this up and looking at it, it's reminding me that someone looking at this painting um, interpreted this uh, as a door that's almost lying flat um, against the landscape with the pebble kind of being placed where a door handle would be um, and the shadow possibly, the shadow to the right possibly indicating that the door is opening. Um, so like I said, I, I think there's a variety of ways that you can interpret um, what he's doing with this wall. And I, um, I certainly have not found any definitive um, suggestion that it has a specific meaning. Thanks, Shelley. So we're going to stay with this work of art. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Harry has a, a question about it. Um, she, I guess, first shared an observation, which is not only um, is the shoe beneath this figure's skin, but also it appears that perhaps the fish are. And she noted that she that Dolly, Dolly and um, Gala perhaps met um, by the beach on vacation. And so she's curious if if the fish might also be a representation of their relationship. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, I think that's a really great interpretation um, and um, could very well play into it. Um, they, um, Dolly's family, Dolly was from um, the north of Spain, Cadiz, which um, was, is kind of outside of Barcelona. And then they had um, kind of like this, Dali then lived uh, in the later part of his life, or I think in the 30s, he and Gala purchased basically like a, a fishing hut uh, in Port Egot, um, which was a even more isolated kind of coastal town. Um, and so certainly that was a large part um, of, of Dali's background and his life was um, that coastal life. And um, as you say, then uh, Gala gets incorporated into that the, the summer that they met in 1929. Um, and, and kind of fell in love was it happened while they were um, at, at the beach. Um, I think also another possible interpretation, um, knowing how much uh, surrealism kind of uh, looks to uh, Sigmund Freud and those theories is that the fish is sometimes considered to be a symbol for the male. Um, and so, I have sometimes wondered if, um, as I said before, if you see the figures kind of adjoining of the two, um, you could possibly interpret it as the fish is a symbol for a male and the shoe is sometimes then considered a symbol for uh, the female in the sense that it's um, a vessel-like object. Um, so that's another interpretation that um, we've played with. Um, but I, I like that suggestion um, about it referencing this time and place that, that he and Gala met. I think that's really lovely. Thanks, Shelley. The next two questions have to do with the Venus. Um, and there's curiosity um, from Stephanie about kind of the symbolism of the drawers. And then Maria's curious about the Venus itself and whether the Venus had a particular meaning for him as um, it, it appeared to be perhaps an obsession? Um, I guess I'll start with the second question. I'm, I really am not sure. Um, I mean, I think, um, I mean, we certainly see him playing with that female form. And so I, I don't know if it's just the female figure or if it's specifically the Venus, um, that's the inspiration. Um, I think, I think what we see him doing um, and what I hope I showed a little bit is the way that he, he takes, he creates some kind of form and then he likes to use it and reuse it and reuse it. And so I think that that's certainly at play here. Um, whether that was just kind of uh, a trope that he was using or whether it was uh, because he was, you know, had this obsession with the Venus figure, um, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of the drawers, um, I think I think that there is probably um, sexual innuendos there um, that he's playing with. I think I like the interpretation that you know that it's this linguistic confusion of the chest of drawers, but I think that that's probably 
uh, it might be simplifying um, what's really happening there. I think Dali um, probably liked that interpretation as well, um, but I've, I would venture a guess that he was um, playing with something a little bit more um, in terms of the female body and the drawers being opened and closed. Thank you. So this question is more kind of at the macro level. Um, when we think about Dolly's production, about prints, sculptures, and paintings like you've shown us today, do you have a sense of the percentages? You know, did he tend to work mainly, we think of him, I think, largely as a painter, but how did his uh, production actually kind of shake out? Uh, well, I can answer that very roughly, um, which is to say, um, you know, his career started uh, really in the mid 20s when he was a student and um, it started with paintings primarily and and especially into the 30s, the, the period of the 1930s, um, which he's most well known for, um, you know, all those types of paintings that I was showing, um, he really is predominantly painting. And then I think there's only, I wanna say just a handful, um, probably less than five prints um, that he created um, at least through the 30s, if not into the 40s. Um, it wasn't until his late career um, maybe the 50s, but certainly starting in the 60s, um, all of a sudden he started creating uh, his canvases, his paintings became much bigger, um, which probably resulted in him not creating as many paintings. Um, and then at this moment in the 60s, you see this influx of prints. Um, so it really kind of swaps. Um, so his early career is really based in painting and his late career is really based in printmaking. Thank you. So I'm going to pull us back again to the fish man because there's been two questions okay. um, about the clock and the time that it's set to. It appears to read seven o'clock a.m. p.m. I don't know. Um, and someone says that that is the same as what we see in his other work, The Persistence of Memory. So do you know anything about the time and if yes. there's a particular meaning? Well, yes, but no. I mean, this is a question that I have um, been really curious about as well. And um, I haven't gotten that far with finding anything that's at least been published um, about this suggesting that it's purposeful. But I've likewise noticed um, there are a number of his paintings beyond just um, the Fishman and the Persistence of Memory that seem to have approximately this time. Um, there are also other examples where the time is different, so it's not always uh, set at this time, um, but you are good to know. Let's see if I can move forward in the, yeah, you can see there the, the clock that's over the, the edge is, seems to be about the same time. Um, I have not been able to find anything that would indicate what specifically that time might be referencing. Um, and I can't, I've never been able to come up with something that I know about his biography. Um, you know, he there's a, he's written um, uh, an autobiography that's probably more myth than truth. And then there's a really great, very long um, biography on Dali by uh, Ian Gibson, I believe is the author. Um, and it is, chock full of um, lots of information and great stories. And in all of my reading, I've never really landed on anything that um, signifies to me the, the importance or meaning of, you know, three minutes to 7 a.m. or p.m. Um, I partly wonder if it's just an aesthetic uh, choice of the way those hands land um, that was pleasing. Um, but again, uh, as much as we read into Dali and knowing kind of these hidden uh, symbols that we find throughout his works, it's hard to believe that it would just be an aesthetic uh, choice. Um, so that is certainly a question that continues to haunt me. And I'm, I'm certain that there's probably an answer out there somewhere, but I haven't landed on it yet. Well, perhaps we can all continue looking and thinking about it. I think we have time for one final question since we did start um, just, just a bit late. And this one is about the print series, about Alia. So I think it's Linda who notes that, that that series was completed about a year after the end of the sixth, um, 
is it the six years war, six day war, sorry. Um, so is there any connection between that? Was, was this a commemoration? Ooh, that I do, I'm, I do not know. Um, I have to admit that the print series is probably the work that I know the least about. Um, and I mean, that actually, if, if there is a connection there, that would, that connection I, I would bet comes from um, Samuel Shore, who is the person that commissioned the, the series. That would not have been um, something that Dali uh, connected. Um, as I said, it was a commission that he fulfilled and a lot of the prints um, that he did were to fulfill commissions. Um, in my opinion, they start to become uh, less creative and original than his paintings. Um, and I think that is in part because he's fulfilling commissions. Um, so to the best of my knowledge, um, if those are connected, uh, that was not a connection that Dali was making himself. Well, Shelley, thank you so much. If if you could see the chat box, you would see just a, a lot of glowing messages thanking you for, for what you've done this afternoon. This has been a really uh, fantastic look at a, a fascinating artist in our collection. So thank you so much.